This podcast is brought to you by AJ Bell and Shares Magazine. Shares Magazine is published by AJ Bell Media, part of AJ Bell. Hi, I'm Dan Coatesworth. Welcome to the latest episode of the AJ Bell Money and Markets podcast. This week, Danny Houston and I will be making sense of all the comings and goings in the world of finance. So many of us are affected by what's happening with interest rates, inflation and more. I feel every time I look at my computer, something else has happened. We're recording this, of course, on Wednesday lunchtime, so I can't promise that everything won't have changed, but we're going to break it down in small segments and explain the big issues facing consumers and businesses from the falling pound and rising interest rates, why certain stocks have been dropping on the stock market and why everyone's been talking about gilt yields. Now stick with us because hopefully we'll be able to put some of this stuff into plain English. Now, later in the podcast, I'll be looking at why so many chief executives have been quitting FTSE 100 companies this year. We'll also have Joe Baumfreund from Asset Manager AVI on the show to talk about investing in Japan. He's just got back from a trip to Tokyo and has some fascinating insights into what's going on over there. Now, for now, let's take the big issues facing people in the UK and go through them one by one. So hopefully you'll have a better understanding of why they matter. So, Danny, let's start with why the falling pound affects everyone. Um, Because we import a huge amount of stuff here in the UK and we buy a lot of that stuff in dollars and the pound has been falling particularly sharply against the dollar. I mean, it got to a record low earlier this week of one dollar three cents rallied a touch but we're we're still talking about you know one dollar six cents one dollar seven cents it just means that everything is more expensive and as you said we're going to try and break it down into little segments i'm going to start with food because we all need to eat and we know already how much more we've been paying for our food when we've gone to the supermarkets and taken a look at the end of the till and taken a great big gulp. Um, We had some numbers out today from uh, Nielsen BRC tracker has found that average food prices spiked by a record 10.6% in September and What's happened with the pound just means that we're going to be paying even more on top of that. So even though we have been talking about inflation coming down a touch, coming down under that 10% mark, what's happened with the pound just means, I'm afraid, that a lot of items are going to be going back up the other way. What about energy and fuel? Is there any good news on that front? Uh, (laughs) There is a little bit of good news because, of course, the one thing that the government has done in its mini budget is effectively, you know, give the big green light to those price cap measures. So what we're paying for our gas and electric won't change. Um, It does mean that for taxpayers, the amount of cash it's going to cost to to fund those measures, ultimately, that is going to cost more because We pay for an awful lot of things like gas in dollars, and um, we also pay for oil in dollars. And that's a biggie because the AA's already calculated that the falling pound has added £4.95 to the cost of filling up a 55-litre family car. And when we think about the last lot of inflation figures, it was the falling cost of motor fuel that was having a big impact. And, you know, for people that don't drive, don't have a car, um, or maybe have an electric car, the the price of um, filling up, not filling up, but charging up your electric car at those, um, the the, um, public charging points has been going up as well. But, you know, if you think about goods being transported around the country, a lot of that is done on the back of a truck. And that just means that prices are higher. And it also means, Dan, that clothing prices are higher. Yeah, I think this is perhaps an underappreciated um, sort of factor. Of course, like you said, a weaker pound means it's more expensive to buy goods from abroad. Now, that's a big problem for lots of the clothing sellers, because they source a lot of material, particularly from Asia. So, You know, it's getting a bit chilly now. You're probably thinking about maybe I should put a jumper on. Um, Certainly if you want to sort of perhaps avoid putting that central heating on just yet. Because if you go and buy 
one from the shops, you might actually find they're going to be a little bit more expensive than you previously went there because clothing manufacturers just want to try and pass on any extra costs to ultimately the end customer. And you know, this problem even extends if you're going away overseas on holiday. Now, that is definitely going to cost you a lot more. Now, I remember going to the US probably about 15, 17 years ago, and I'm pretty sure that a pound would have got you nearly two dollars now it's only going to buy you pretty much a dollar so but but actually if, you, if you're an american coming to the uk you, you'll definitely be in a good place because your dollar will buy you a considerably more pounds than it did uh you know 10 to 20 years ago so actually that could be good for tourism coming into the uk it's interesting what you say about uh buying extra layers um i've wandered down this morning and it was a, a beautiful clear morning really crisp and cold and I've turned my thermostat down and I still touch the radiator and one had dropped on so I dropped it down by another degree because it's like <laughs> no it's still September there is no way um, and we, we've been talking about inflation Dan now for months and uh, one of the things that we have expected to happen that we've been told should happen was that the scary number which some economists have been talking about of a, a peak in inflation of 18 percent wouldn't happen because of the measures which have been brought in to cap energy prices um, and the bank of england saying that it expected inflation to peak slightly above 11 percent in october then we had the mini budget the pound falling and frankly, all bets are off. What it has done with markets has, has triggered a, a clamour for the Bank of England to do more, to, to stabilise the pound. There were a lot of calls for an emergency rate rise. Um, so far, the Bank of England have said, look, you know, we're, we're just going to take a breath. We're going to see what happens with the pound and we will act very decisively on interest rates, but we won't act until November. There's a bit of a quirk where the Monetary Policy Committee only meets 10 months out of the year, not 12 months. But I've been watching the probability tables for how much markets are expecting rates to increase by at that November meeting. And latest expectations are for at least a one and a quarter percent increase in November, taking the base rate to 3.5 percent. But, you know, that split's getting ever closer to a 50-50 split with almost half of investors thinking that a one and a half percent rate is hike is the most likely and that the UK base rate will hit 6% by next spring. Now, uh, I was asking uh, Laura Souter the last time that uh, a rate hike bigger than 1.25% um, was, uh, and she said it was in 1985 when rates jumped by 2% in a month, but it had only happened four times in history since 1981. So, you know, these are pretty incredible times that we're living through at the moment it doesn't feel incredible if you are one of the people who are now at a point where either you're looking to get on the housing ladder you're trying to get a mortgage or you're looking to remortgage because all the instability the opaqueness the fact that you know really we just can't know what the bank of england is going to have to do over the next few months to keep inflation down, to put their foot harder on the brake with the government sticking its foot hard on the accelerator. So we've seen an awful lot of lenders pulling mortgage products and uh, I was having a look at uh, Moneyfax and they said that they've seen the highest ever daily fall in available residential mortgage deals. Now, last night, it recorded a 935 product drop, which is, just to put it in some kind of context, because the, the last big sort of meltdown was the start of the COVID lockdown back on the 1st of April 2020, when 462 products were taken away. So this is absolutely massive. And if you think about people who maybe got on the housing ladder or, or moved house and, and took out a two-year fixed deal, 
just after COVID when the housing market exploded because we had that stamp duty holiday, then they're looking at when it comes to remortgaging, adding a huge amount of extra payments onto their monthly payment. In fact, um, it, roughly 50 pound more a month or 600 pounds more a year if um, for every one percentage point your mortgage rate increases per 100,000 pounds of mortgage debt. Now, I've got to say that for people who have their mortgage coming to an end, their fixed rate coming to an end in the next few months, it might be wise to take a look now and to see what kind of exit penalties are in place with your fixed rate mortgage and work out whether or not you might be better to remortgage now rather than wait until that um, mortgage uh, fixed term comes to an end. It's incredibly worrying times, Dana. I know a lot of people are really terrified about what's happening as, as all the other um, prices go up. Now, for exporters, actually what's going on with the pound could be good news. I know. I mean, it, it does seem like doom and gloom across the board, but you know, there are some pockets of sort of positivity. So a weak pound is good for companies who export goods overseas because uh, for, for someone who is abroad and is paying, uh, you know, in another currency, they look at what the UK is doing. And of course, everything that we're, we're offering to export is now looking much more affordable. So some of the UK's top exports are machinery, um, vehicles and pharmaceuticals. Now, the weak pound is not only a benefit to overseas companies if they're looking to buy things, uh, goods and services in the UK, but, but actually also works in their favour if they're looking to buy companies outright. Because um, yeah, we saw when the Brexit referendum happened, 2016, um, the vote, we saw lots of foreign companies acting on the weak pound then and making takeover offers for UK companies. Now, this has been happening on several occasions this year, but I would expect to see it accelerate. The more the pound falls, the more those UK companies are looking more affordable to overseas buyers. And you know, we, we already know that the UK stock market was cheap. UK stocks have been on relatively cheap valuations compared to lots of other places in the world. They're now even cheaper. So um, you, know, you, you might get a 20% bid premium, um, a company paying 20% above the market price to buy something. But of course, you just remember there is a negative side there. You might actually lose a good investment that could have generated really good returns for you over the long term. So um, I always think there's two sides to the story there with, with takeovers. Not necessarily good news for everyone. It was interesting to um, take a look at the Biffa takeover, which um, was agreed earlier this week, and to note that the money on the table now as the deal is agreed is less than the money that had been on the table but it, it still seemed to make sense to the board because they're looking at, at a weakening economic outlook yeah it is you know it's a strange one and, and particularly if you think that um picking up your bins and recycling is you know fairly resilient um it's quite surprised that they they went for uh, you know, a, a lower offer price, but um, you know, such is the times that we live in at the moment. Now, today, Wednesday, as we record this Wednesday lunchtime, um, my phone hasn't stopped binging. And the only thing people to talk about is guilt. I'm sure there will be people out there who are wondering what on earth is a guilt? What does it mean when guilt yields are rising? And why on earth is everybody talking about it right now, Dan? Well, UK government bonds are guilts. So that's the first thing to, to appreciate. So um, this is all to do with the price at which the government pays to borrow money. So uh, you know, a, a bond is an instrument but whereby, um, you know, for a government, they say, uh, we need some cash. Um, if you give up, if as an investor, you give us some money, we'll agree to pay you um, this rate of interest. And at the end of a certain term, we'll pay you the initial money back again. The same thing works with corporate bonds. That's when companies want to, to borrow money. So what's happened is at the start of the year, the yield on the 10-year government bond or GILT 
was at 1%. Now it's gone up to more than 4.5% um, as we've just before we've recorded this. So now as yields go up, the price of the bond falls. So what, what's whilst everyone in, in on the news is talking about how yields are going up, you might think that's a good thing. What actually means is the price of these bonds has been plummeting. So someone who bought a tracker fund that follows a basket of gilts at the start of the year might have seen the value of their investment fall by more than 25%. So th this is not normal. You know, UK government bonds are meant to be really boring, really sort of stodgy, <laughs> slow, <laughs> steady investments. You don't, you don't, you're just not ex expecting this to happen. But what the fact is that because the yield's gone up so much more, it makes it much more expensive for the government to borrow money. So, of course, you know, we had the mini budget last week. The government says we're going to do all these extra things and uh, and everyone's going, well, how are you going to fund it? And they're going to say, well, we'll pay for this through debt. This is what's shocking people. So, you know, only a few days ago, the Bank of England said it was going to start to sell gov UK government bonds that was bought under the previous quantitative easing programme. So I'm sorry to keep using all these terms uh, uh, if you're not familiar with them, but they, unfortunately, there's certain things you need to understand what's going on. So if you cast your mind back, um, quantitative easing involves buying bonds from financial institutions and, and they take that money to lend to businesses or individuals or, or they use it to invest. And the end goal is to help stimulate the economy. So this has been going on for, for, for a long time. Now, this year, central banks said they're going to start shifting to something called quantitative tightening. And that's reducing the size of these holdings that have been built up. So, i.e., they were going to start to sell these gilts. Now, just before we start to record this podcast, the Bank of England came out and said, we know last week we said we're going to sell them. Actually, what we're going to now do is buy more gilts, not sell them. And what actually happened, the guilt yields then quickly dropped below 4% on the 10-year bond and equities started to move slightly higher. But the pound fell. So we don't have, this was, this was designed, you know, the Bank of England's actions was designed to sort of uh, bring those guilt yields down. So, but what happens to the pound is, is sort of a, a different conversation. You know, rising interest rates that we're seeing at the moment typically would push up the value of a country's currency. But that's not happening in the UK because the market is still questioning the cost of this government's new plan. So it, it, it's complicated, isn't it, Danny? Yeah. It is complicated. And I think what's really important for people to know is that the intervention by the Bank of England sort of almost putting their foot back on the accelerator pedal at a time when they're also pumping hard on the brake to keep inflation down, it, it's sort of quite jarring. They're only intending to do this quantitative easing for a limited period of time, just, just a matter of weeks, I think it is, up to the middle of October. But it was crucial just to prop up things like some of our pension funds. Well, yeah. I mean, defined benefit pension schemes hold about £1.5 trillion in assets. And now half of those held in guilt. So, you know, when you've got you know, panic on the guilt market, it is bad for pension funds and for people obviously in retirement who've invested in them. Now, again, let's say people put their money to these things thinking they'd be slow and steady investments and they, and they just haven't been. So, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think you're right in saying that the, the Bank of England is only going to be doing this sort of um, buying for a short time. And it's actually said from the end of October, it will then start to sell again. So effectively, the government has a month to think hard about what is it doing? Has it got any flaws in its policies and to make some changes? And I, and I think that the whole country is hoping that we'll, we will see some changes in its policies. Otherwise, it's going to be more pain, I think. Because we don't have a date in the diary for this next fiscal event uh, until November. But it feels like Kwasi Kwarteng, the new Chancellor, Liz Trust, the new Prime Minister, need to get ahead of this some way. They need to have discussions with, with the public, with investors, 
and really clarify exactly what it is their policy is intended to achieve and how they've costed the whole thing out, exactly when we'll start to see growth, how these tax cuts will really work and exactly what the public finances are, are looking like. Because the one thing that this new chancellor hasn't done, he, he doesn't have a track record that he can fall back on and, and sort of point to everyone and say, look, you, you know me, you know my track record. When I tell you that this is going to work, you can know it's going to work. And for a new government to come in and be so bold, but without all the usual fiscal red tape that goes with these events, I mean, have you ever experienced a period like this, Dan? I'm not talking about COVID. I'm talking about reaction to a budget. No, I mean, this is the, the chance has only been office for a matter of days. Uh, we've had you know, absolute sort of chaos. And it's it, um, and then sort of sort of ever since, you know, people have been saying, you know, we've got so many questions about what, what you know you're doing. He hasn't really been very visible since then. So um so we, we don't we sort of try and take any sort of political sides on the on the podcast um but you know we're just sort of reporting on exactly what we're seeing um uh, and it, it, and i think that there needs to be some answers or, or certainly some sort of debate negotiation about you know are they really doing the right thing and, it, and it's and it's not just the public who are confused um and perhaps a bit unhappy the international monetary fund is certainly very unhappy with the uk government and certainly had some sort of harsh words to say about what's going on so da danny you know do you want to sort of give a summary of what the imf has, has been talking about yeah in a nutshell um it, it issued a really unusually outspoken statement we are quite used to hearing from the International Monetary Fund um, criticising developing countries when they're seen to make policy mistakes, policy mistakes which have a detrimental impact on, on their economy uh, and on then the global economy. But it is really unusual for it to focus on one of the major economic powers, which, of course, the UK is absolutely one. It is issued a statement openly criticizing the tax cut plans, warning that the measures are likely to fuel the cost of living crisis and increase inequality. Um, it, it's been really interesting to, to hear the kind of voices coming out and criticizing these kind of policies. I mean, some people have said that they've, they've done this because they're, um, taking a stance and demonstrating that, that they're not just criticizing developing countries, that they're more than prepared to criticize any country that they feel isn't working in the best interests. And of course, the, what happens in the UK does have global repercussions. What really caught my eye as well is we had the White House's economic advisor, Brian Deese, who also seemed to criticize the economic policy. He said that in a monetary tightening cycle like this, the challenge with that policy is it just puts the monetary authority in a position potentially to move even tighter saying, look, it is particularly important to maintain a focus on fiscal prudence, fiscal discipline. So when you sort of read behind the lines bit, it, it basically he's saying that he doesn't believe what he's seeing from the new chancellor is a budget, a mini budget, fiscal statement, whatever it is that you want to call what we had last Friday. But he's effectively saying that he doesn't believe that that is based on fiscal prudence and fiscal discipline. So when you have friends and organizations like the IMF, making those kind of public statements, that's not the kind of thing that the UK expects, not, not at all. And it's we've had some really strange reactions to the budget. Um, we had house builders initially jumping, but then everything went into free fall what you've been looking at the the last 
week, the last few days since that mini budget, what have been the key things that you've seen on the FTSE 100 and 250? Well, FTSE 100 is down 2.6% since that budget was announced. The FTSE 250 is down 6.4%. So that's a big move in what is less than a week. You know, FTSE 100 is perhaps helped by having lots of companies that benefit from weak pound because you know three quarters of its constituents earn overseas but the FTSE 250 is only about half of them overseas so half of its constituents are really indicative of the domestic economy so um you know when you see sort of a more than six percent fall in just a few days that's the market saying we are not happy about the outlook here uh, it's really quite gloomy and things are a lot worse than what was already a bad situation. Don't forget that the market's been pricing in bad stuff all year to suddenly get this new leg down. It's pretty, pretty bad. I mean, what? so maybe we should we talk about individual sectors. So, Danny, what 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 did you sort of see with um, house builders or property related sort of stocks? Yeah, uh, as I said uh, uh, just a moment ago, we did see house builders um, rallying um, quite substantially uh, ahead of the budget on speculation that there would be cuts to stamp duty. And there have been cuts to stamp duty. We've seen um, stamp duty, the, the threshold at which you pay stamp duty jump from £125,000 to £250,000 and up to um, £425,000 from first-time buyers. And when you see cuts to stamp duty, certainly when we saw the, the stamp duty holiday during COVID, those savings spur people on to buy houses, to buy houses much more quickly than they otherwise would have because that they don't have to, to save up that extra chunk of cash. But... And of course, it's a big but. What we've seen with the um, falling pound and the pressure on the Bank of England to increase interest rates and the speculation that now interest rates will get up to, you know, 6% and more has led to a lot of people thinking that there is going to be a crash in the housing market, that property prices are going to fall over the next six to 12 months by somewhere between 20 and 40 percent. That's some of the worst case scenarios that, that I've heard uh, mentioned. Lots of headlines, obviously, about that. And then that creates uh, another issue where if people are bought at the, the top of the market, if we see house prices fall significantly, then you end up with those gaps, those shortfalls, which, you know, nobody wants to see that that negative equity. But I just had a look at how um, the house builders uh, responded in in the wake of the budget actually being announced, and they're all down. Um, and, and we're talking about down in double figures. So Taylor Wimpy down 16% since close on the Thursday before the budget. Uh, we've got Vistry Group down 15%, Barrett down 13%, Bellway down. 16%. So it just demonstrates that house builders are really concerned. We also had Rightmove, of course, um, the property website that has taken a serious hit as well. So despite the fact that this budget was to, supposed to stimulate the housing market to, to prevent any cooling, actually how it seems to have impacted at the moment is incredibly negatively on property related stocks you've been looking at long duration assets yeah so i mean this is property and infrastructure investment trusts so th these are you know kind of like funds that will have stakes in different projects or different companies that are involved in these areas so um now again you'd think that someone's got investments in commercial property uh you know how how is this negatively affected by what's going on in the budget but the reason why these shares absolutely plummeted um in in recent days is all to do with the discount rate 
and the likelihood of much higher interest rates. So it, it's just about how future cash flows are valued now. It's a bit it's a bit technical, but really, um, I think what you'll see is that like people being surprised when they you know they own gilts and they've seen um, sort of the value of an investment for this year for what was meant to be a sort of safe and boring investment. I think there's going to be lots of people who are invested in infrastructure and property spaces again thinking, you know, I bought these because you know at the start of the year all the sort of the go go growth uh, stocks you know tech names offering um big gains in the future they they went out of favor so everyone's looking for something a bit more stodgy now these are falling so unfortunately it does show you the risks of uh, putting money into the stock market but you know this is very you know i'm not going to use that word Oh, well, I'll have to say it, unprecedented, but um, which was overused <laughs> during the, the COVID times. But you know, this is a very unusual situation that we're in now. Um, all I'd say is don't panic, sit tight, um, and let's just see how things play out before you, you know, sort of um you think, okay, I'll I've just have to radically rethink everything in my portfolio at the moment. Yeah, well, a lot yeah. of knee-jerk reaction, um, I think, there's been. But that, that seems to have been something of a hallmark of the entire year. Um, with the volatility has come huge sell-offs and then, you know, a spot of bargain hunting and then another shudder seems to go through markets and there are more huge sell-offs and then some more bargain hunting. And investors just don't seem to be prepared at the moment to let the dust settle before they're off and running again no i mean it's it is is a difficult situation and i think one of the sectors that's been absolutely battered beaten up totally bruised more than anything else is anything that sells to the consumer so retailers in particular they've had a pretty bad time haven't they Danny? they have had an incredibly bad time yeah absolutely um all those sort of non-essential goods and services the the nice to haves if you can afford it but right now a lot of people are just completely unsure of what they're going to be able to afford and and are just absolutely cutting back so just having a look at how some of the retailers have been performing since um close of play last thursday some big falls. Um, Dunelm down 10%, Fraser's down 10%, um, B&M down 9%, ASOS down 13%. Um, of course, not all of this is related at all in any way to what happened with that mini budget, but it's just compounded um, investors' nervousness about how the consumer is going to behave in the coming months, what inflation is going to do and, and what's going to be left in our pockets. And this is a sector which is already being battered, as you've said. And, and just to give you some idea, we had another profit warning this morning from Boohoo um, saying that customers were cutting back. You know, they're, they're worried about paying their bills. They're um, returning more stuff. And the fashion retailer, which owns Pretty Little Thing, Karen Millen Brands, swung to a pre-tax loss of £15.2 million for these six months to the 31st of August. Now, that's down from a £24.6 million profit for the same time a year ago. And it's expecting sales to continue decline over the next six months. So pretty tough time for retailers. And just looking at some of the other, um, the um, travel stocks and um, hospitality stocks, all those things, those sort of nice to haves, EasyJet today, um, well, since last um, Thursday's close down 11%. Mitchells and Butlers, the pub group down 16%, Weatherspoons also down 16%, you know, thinking that maybe people won't be going out for a pint quite in the same way that they were going out for a pint. Though it's quite interesting that um, IAG, British Airways owner, down only about 4%. And I wonder if that plays into some of the things that you were talking about earlier, just in terms of US holiday makers now coming over to the UK because 
the exchange rate is just looking much more favorable and and maybe they're hoping that uh, that will help sort of differentiate them from uh, from what's going in going on in the UK um it's a huge amount of of bad news and it's really affecting confidence well it is i mean if you think about businesses um there's lots going on that could affect their earnings so you know if inflation keeps going up it's going to cost more to borrow um you know and, and we're looking at a pretty horrible backdrop in terms of uncertainties of a demand so I, I, you know, businesses are probably going to think twice about how they spend money so in, in normal times they might buy more equipment they'd hire more people open more sites you know, all of those things are going to be sort of scaled back i think you know profit margins are being squeezed expansion looks quite risky at the moment labor costs are already going up so i think they're just going to look at existing staff to say can they do more rather than we take on extra people and of course this shift in expectations for what businesses are doing uh, means that earnings forecasts are having to be changed and for most companies the direction of travel is actually having downgraded expectations for earnings and of course earnings are the key share price driver so if a company's expected to make a little bit less than previously thought well the share price will fall to reflect this change in earnings assumptions so you know you've had up all these sort of moving parts it's no wonder that you know investor confidence has been falling i think there's fewer people willing to step in and sort of buy bargains at the moment existing investors are getting worried perhaps they might be selling down some of their holdings so all of this sort of you know, wraps up to be, um, you know, quite a sort of serious situation. But as I said before, sit tight, be patient. Investing is all about sitting through the ups and downs. And, you know, we are very much in a down sort of part of the cycle at the moment. But um, who knows when it will start to get better? Hopefully it will start to get better soon. And that's... <laughs> That's part and parcel of investing, isn't it? It, it goes up and it goes down. And um, I think over the last couple of years, investors, particularly investors that, that are new to investing, maybe they started investing um, during lockdowns and haven't ever witnessed the kind of downturn that we're seeing at the moment. But people that have been investing for a long time will tell you that shares go down and then you know they come back up again and there are some shares which are doing okay i know that there is a small that we said was a little bit of good news earlier there is still another bit of good news we haven't mentioned is that not everything has fallen in value since this dreaded mini budget we talked about biffa having a takeover its shares have gone up um you've had a couple of defensive names like uh, gsk hikma pharmaceuticals and the vet company CVS, they've all seen their share prices rise. So it, you know, it just goes to show, you know, just because everything's looking gloomy on the news headlines, doesn't mean to say everything on the stock market will automatically be falling. So um, stick stick with it is my message. Now, I've been looking at um, a, a really sort of interesting um, situation at the moment which is the revolving doors at FTSE 100 companies. There seems to have been an awful lot of movement over the last year. I've got up to a count of 18, uh, but I know that even more CEOs have left or have announced that they're resigning. What's the tally at the moment? Yeah, I mean, I, I was sort of trying to do the maths on this. I think I got to about 17, 18. It's um, either gone this year or they've said they're going to be going and they may just, there'll be a changeover next year. But you know, historically, you're probably looking more in the region of 12 a year at the most. And I think this is a very strange situation now. You've got everything going wrong. You're thinking, oh, all these people just rushing out before things get even worse. But I think one of the, one of the things to think about is, a lot of these CEOs will have taken the job before the pandemic started. And at that time, they might have thought, OK, we could probably I could take this role, drive growth. The, the backdrop's pretty positive. Um, but, what, you know, almost straight into certain certain people's um, sort of period with with a the company, they've had to find that it's changed exactly what they're doing. It's all about 
having to deal with sudden setbacks, having to scale back expansion, cut those costs. And really, it's just about steadying the ship. And, and for some people, they say, well, that's that's not my leadership expertise. I'm about growing companies or, or you know, I'm not here simply to just make sure that we're surviving for another day. So, you know, I think some of the companies where um, the CEOs are, are about to change include Whitbread, Rightmove, Rolls-Royce and Shell. Now, when Alan Joke at Unilever said he was leaving um, a couple of days ago, the share price actually went up. And that's the market's way of saying, hooray, we can't <laughs> wait to see the back of him. Um, <laughs> you know, he's been the boss for five years and the share price and the business, has barely, they've barely gone anywhere under his leadership. So, I, you know, he looked over um, a failed bid for Glaxo's consumer health arm, lots of criticism that he was spending far too long on ESG things and not actually running the business. And then we had an activist investor come in. So really, I think of all the all the announcements of someone leaving a FTSE 100 company, he's the least surprising. More of a shock was when b and Simon Aurora said he was off because he'd done a lot to really grow that business. So I think, it, you know, just a sort of final point on this, it's hard to say whether someone new you know, outside the company joining is better than promoting someone internally. You know, external person will probably bring a different way of thinking, lots of fresh ideas, hopefully, but equally, someone who's already with the company will understand its culture and you should know the business inside out. So I, I just think it's, it's hard to sort of say, you know, yes, whenever you see someone external come to join a company, it's, it's thumbs up. You have to look at each one with, uh, in different circumstances, but uh, it is it is very strange how we've had so many leave so far this year. I mean, it has been an absolutely tumultuous period of time that these CEOs have had to to deal with to live through. I mean, you just think about um, COVID lockdowns and um, trying to get people to work from home, putting in new IT systems, you know, trying to make sure that everyone was safe and then dealing with inflation and, and now dealing with interest rate rises. I mean, they've been buffeted. That will have been an awful lot of late nights and Zoom calls and worry. So you can sort of understand why the number is, is quite as high as it is uh, at the moment. Um, We've been talking a lot about the UK for obvious reasons, and we've been talking an awful lot about the UK pound, but we're not the only country which is suffering from a weak currency. Japan's also been in the spotlights. The yen has been struggling. To better understand what this means, Dan caught up with Joe Baumfreund, who runs the AVI Japan Opportunity Trust, to talk about what he's been seeing with Japanese companies and why he's taking an activist approach. Let's hear what he had to say. So, Joe, perhaps briefly, why, why should someone consider having exposure to Japan in their investment portfolio? Well, I think right now there are, there are probably three good reasons uh, to consider having exposure to Japan, and particularly to the kind of companies that we're exposed to in AVI Japan Opportunity Trust. So the first reason is really fundamental valuations. Japan, uh, and particularly small cap companies in Japan, are really cheap. Uh, our portfolio companies are trading at an average enterprise value to EBITDA multiple and earnings multiple of five or six times, which is way, way lower than what you can find elsewhere in the world. So buying good quality companies at low valuations is always a good idea, I think. The second attraction of Japan right now is that it's one thing to buy companies on cheap valuations, but... The question is, and what's going to happen to make those valuations uh, become more, more, um, more normal? And the good thing about Japan is there's a catalyst, really, for those valuations to re-rate. And that catalyst is a combination of shareholder activism, which we, which we are very um, involved in in Japan, coupled with a regulatory environment that encourages companies to do more for shareholders and encourages shareholders to push companies to do more for them. That's the corporate governance code and the stewardship code. So you've got valuation and you've got a catalyst. And the final attraction I think of Japan is a little bit more uh, difficult to be precise about, but it really relates to the currency 
And as we know, the Japanese yen has been extremely weak over the past six to 12 months. And that reflects the, the divergent monetary policy uh, between uh, the rest of the developed world and, and Japan. And whilst it may look uh, like that could continue for a while, um, we know that currencies are notoriously difficult to predict and to time, but Japan, or the Japanese yen rather, is uh, fundamentally cheap. If you go to Japan now, um, things are much cheaper than they are here in the UK. And on a purchasing power parity basis, uh, the yen is um, as cheap as it's ever been. And at some point, the, the drivers of um, the, the moves in the currency market will change. And what's been a headwind uh, for our performance as a sterling-based investor will become a tailwind. So I know that you've just come back from a trip to Tokyo. What was the sort of the general mood like? Um, I presume you went to see quite a few companies while you were there. Yeah, that's right. We saw lots of companies and lots of lots of other investors, actually. Um the, I would say the Japanese companies are rarely um, fist-thumpingly optimistic. So I would say the mood was cautious optimism. Um, optimism based around the fact that they're, they're coming out of uh, COVID restrictions a, a little bit later than, than us here in the UK, but they're returning to a semblance of normality. There are signs that tourism or well, the country is opening up for tourism, which is likely to be very positive. And they've come through the crisis well. Balance sheets are intact and, and um, profit forecasts remain robust. So they're reasonably optimistic. Um, they're cautious because they have the same uh, concerns that we do elsewhere in the world relating to inflationary pressures and rising input costs and the ability to maintain margins in that environment. But generally, when we speak to companies, um, we see uh, that whereas in the past, companies would have been reluctant to pass on higher costs to their loyal customers, it would have been seen as a mark of disrespect to do so. The fact that everybody's in the same boat and everybody's facing cost pressures means that they're much more um, open to the idea of passing on costs and maintaining their margins. So I would say pretty um, cautiously optimistic. So uh, earlier you mentioned about the sort of the weak currency. Um, I mean, what, what does that mean for, for the investments you've actually got? Uh, is it posing any sort of big problems at all? It's not really posing um, any big problems, I would say. The, the, the factors to consider really are twofold. Um, in simple terms, as a sterling-based fund, um, w without hedging the currency, we're exposed to swings in the, in the yen. Uh, right now, those have been a headwind to our performance. So in sterling terms, we have suffered uh, the cost of, of being, exposed, being exposed to yen. At the portfolio level, however, um, different companies will face, will, will experience different uh, reactions to the, weak, to the weakening yen. So exporting com companies will benefit from the weak yen. Importing countries will um, suffer. And the domestic Companies, probably it's probably um, negligible impact, I would say. So our portfolio is largely domestically focused, but there are a number of uh, companies within the portfolio that have some export exposure and they they have benefited from the weekend and continue to do so. So I would say it, it, it's mixed. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was reading something the other day saying that about 40% of Japanese corporations actually have moved their manufacturing capacity to different countries um, since 1995. So I know a lot of people sort of say um, a weak yen is good for companies that export, but actually if we're finding that a good big chunk of them um, actually have costs in other currencies is is, is actually the situation we, we, we might see in the, in the near term is more companies move their manufacturing back to Japan because they could then benefit from a, a much weaker currency. Yeah, that's certainly true of larger companies in Japan that they have shifted a lot of their production overseas. And, and it certainly used to be the case that large exporters such as the car manufacturers um, used to be beneficiaries of a weekend, but are probably less so today because, as you say, they, they, they've shifted their manufacturing overseas. Um, it's an interesting question whether they shift back to, to Japan. Uh, the challenge they would face is a tight labor market. Uh, there's very, very little um, slack in the workforce in Japan. So if they need to hire workers, um, I guess that could put pressure on wages, which would be a good thing as well. 
So what obviously part of your sort of approach is to sort of take a, um, you know, act like a, like an activist investor. So how easy is it been to actually sort of influence change in, in companies in which you have an investment? I don't know whether you could give me an example or two of perhaps some success stories or maybe something that you're working on at the moment. Yeah, so look, it's not easy to be an activist investor in Japan. It's certainly more ch challenging in Japan than it is in other countries. And that is because there's a natural resistance uh, to change and a natural resistance to listening to, to foreign uh, shareholders. But with the introduction of the Corporate Governance Code and the Stewardship Code six or seven years ago now, the environment really has changed. And that has created an environment in which companies are encouraged to listen to shareholders and to work harder for shareholders, which wasn't the case um, historically in Japan. And that has meant there's been a shift in attitude and behavior. So there are more vocal investors uh, interacting with companies, pressurizing them uh, to, to do things in the interest of shareholders. But also um, the kind of investors uh, such as ourselves and the other constructive activists, let's call them, uh, have really adapted the uh, activist playbook to fit the Japanese culture and the Japanese environment. So it's much more patient, it's much more long term, it's much more constructive, it's much more about focusing on areas that they're comfortable speaking about rather than the areas that they're not. So to go into a company in Japan and say you've got all this cash on the balance sheet, give it back to me, is not going to go is not going to go down well. It's not going to work. It doesn't create trust between the two sides. But to go into a company, and this is our approach, um, to understand the nitty gritty of their operations and their strategy, to understand where they're facing challenges, where they could do better, where they're doing well, where there may be opportunities to invest some of that cash in CapEx, in R&D or in M&A, things like that. Those are things they want to talk, talk about. Um, increasingly, most companies in Japan will do share buybacks now, which is a, a major positive shift from, from five and 10 years ago. So if you leave that on the sidelines, and yes, you ask them to do that, but you focus much more on the core operations and strategic side, then that creates a much more trusting dialogue. And I wouldn't say it's easy to get them to change, but it's certainly um, more likely to succeed in those, in those uh, scenarios that you'll see positive shifts in, in behavior and attitude. Would you be able to sort of give me an example of an actual company, um, perhaps to sort of flesh out exactly what what you're tr perhaps trying to achieve at the moment? Yeah, sure. So um, we, we've had a stake in uh, a company called Fujitech, which is one of the world's leading uh, elevator and escalator companies since the fund was launched uh, about four years ago. And we've uh, maintained a, a positive dialogue with management in all that time and uh, encouraged uh, a number of uh, shifts in, in strategy and operations within, within that company over time. And that's led to uh, a re-rating in the share price. When we bought it, it was trading at a significant discount to its international peers. That gap has narrowed um, quite sharply. Uh, it's led to the company doing a strategic review, which considered a number of the points that we raised. Um, we have quite a friendly dialogue. We've published uh, a very detailed 70-odd page uh, research report um, on the internet that everybody could see, uh, arguing our case for what the company um, should do. And that went down well, and the company's really um, adopted a number, of, a number of the suggestions we made, and we continue to have a dialogue with, with the company. So that's one that um, had, some, had some public presence. Increasingly, when you look at our portfolio and you look at some of the larger names in the portfolio, things like um, DTS, the software integration company, or Tihasagawa, the food and flavorings business, or Wacom, the leading um, pen tablet, uh, tablet pen uh, business, uh, we don't have any public campaigns going on there, but you can assume there's quite a, an intense private engagement activity going on there. And, and increasingly, much of our um, activism goes on behind closed doors. And I think that goes down better with the management of uh, Japanese companies, provided that they actually move in the right direction. And occasionally we will go public in some instances to serve as a reminder of what could happen if they don't listen to us. Do you, do you ever think that there's a, a danger that 
companies on the receiving end of your sort of activist campaigns to sort of just say, you know, we understand what you're what you're sort of trying to put across, but right. it's just the wrong time. The global economy is in, in too much of a fragile state now. Is not the time to do any changes. Yeah, this is a, a response we get from uh, some companies in Japan, even at the best of times. They're notoriously cautious and conservative. Um, and we certainly heard those kind of things um, in the early days of COVID when the world was going into lockdown and they had all this cash on the balance sheet. And they said, oh, now's not the time to spend money on share buybacks or give money back to shareholders. We need to retain as much as possible and see, see our way through this, this crisis. But at the end of the day, um, Japanese companies have been around a long time and, and view their, their existence and their opportunities through a very long-term prism, much more long-term than we think about here in the UK. And so they're, they're used to this uh, idea that the short-term could look challenging, but they have to think about the long-term. So yes, they may say things to us like, don't push us, we can't do this now, we need to be worried about the short term. But fundamentally, they've got their eye on the long term and uh, they, they have moved in the right direction. They continue to move in the right direction. To some investors, it's frustratingly slow. But uh, I was advised when I first um, started investing in Japan and, and started uh, this, this fund four or five years ago, um, just to be patient to recognize that things are changing in Japan, but they take a long time. They take longer than anywhere else. But as long as we're moving in the right direction, uh, that's a positive. And I think that's really the attitude of Japanese management. They don't want to do anything drastic. Uh, they don't want to do anything that they'll regret tomorrow, but they, they want to move in a measured way in the right direction. Well, Joe Barron-Froyne from the AVI Japan Opportunity Trust, thank you ever so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. I hope you enjoyed that interview. That's all we've got time for this week. Join us next week where we hope to have several experts on the show giving their views on stocks and lessons to be learned from the 1970s inflation crisis. Until then, thanks very much for listening. Before you go, please remember this podcast is for educational purposes and the views expressed don't necessarily reflect those of AJ Bell or Shares Magazine. The podcast isn't telling you whether certain investments are suitable or not. And don't forget that the value of investments can change and you can lose money as well as make it. It's also important to remember that tax rules apply and that the way an investment performed in the past may not be the same as how it behaves in the future. If you want help, go see a qualified financial advisor. Thank you.